you will only be on the surface. We've seen a lot of young players who play football, but never they never amount to anything. You can be you can be born disadvantaged, but you were not created to be disadvantaged. He is a super promising young Nigerian player that the whole world should look at for. Welcome to Football in the Trenches, where we interview interesting personalities who have had special journeys inside the world of football. And uh, I think uh, we're going to make Prince Ekong, who's with us today, as one of the ambassadors of the program, because he's had probably the most unusual career you could possibly imagine. Um, you've played in on several continents uh, at many different levels with an extreme diversity of teammates, an extreme diversity of colleagues. And you're still there. And I think you're still playing sometimes too. So <laughs> <laughs> your fans would love to hear that, Prince. <laughs> so fantastic. We have a nice backdrop here from your days at um, one of uh, Stockholm's uh, great football clubs, Dior Gordon. Uh, you played in Geis as well. Uh, you played under Carlo Ancelotti in Serie A. Both of you kind of kicked off. You kicked off your European career. He kicked off his coaching career at the same time at Reggiana. Absolutely. Then Slovenia, Switzerland, Mexico, Romania, China. Russia. Russia. Before China before the whole Super League hype or just about you, when it was... You missed you miss Dinamo Moscow. I miss Dinamo Moscow, exactly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I, let me flip the question around, Prince. Where haven't you played? <laughs> <laughs> um, There's you still know, a little opening for New Zealand, Prince. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, J Jesse can fix you up. Uh, so you made, a, you made a real mark on Swedish football, too. Uh, you're, 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 you're a well-known Allsvenskan player. Uh, you're, you played with Geis. You played with Gothenburg. And you managed to play for Nigeria 25 times? Yes, with the A-team. With the A-team, yeah. Uh, and then your real life started after football and you became a community leader, uh, a faith leader. Yes. Uh, and then you're helping players settle in into European football as well. That's right. Uh, so we're going to talk to you about all of that and we really want to hear your perspectives. Uh, this is for the entire English-speaking world. It's for, it's for uh, the American audience as well, but that's what we... We want to hear the we want to hear the journey, Prince. That's right, no problem. Yeah, welcome to the podcast, Prince. Yes. Uh, we yes. want to start by taking you a little bit back to the beginning, really, uh, and telling us a little bit about your upbringing, the area, the environment, family uh, life. Would you be able to take us back a little bit and share us a few of your experiences in growing up? Well, my upbringing I was, I would say, goes like a roller coaster. <laughs> the beginning, I, um, I was born and raised from a royal. My mom's family are, you say, royal family from a small clown, and uh, they are the king of Dinkanga. And uh, when my mom met my dad, uh, he met my dad in Lagos which used to be the capital city many years ago. And my mom relocated down from Akwaibom. Akwaibom is the tourist center actually right now in Nigeria. It's, it's the east part of uh, uh, Nigeria, very beautiful coast uh, waterside. And that's where the British came in actually during the time of colonization. And it's a very beautiful place, very, I mean, the very traditional and wonderful ambience. Uh, my mom and my dad from the same uh, uh, state, actually, but not from the same hometown. And so they both relocated. They didn't know each other. They relocated to Lagos. And my mom came to meet his uncle, who was a uh, was very rich uh, man, was the chairman of the Ikoi uh, Club and also uh, the Petroleum, chairman of the Petroleum, one of the NMPC, was one of the board in NMPC, Nigerian Petroleum. And so when he met my dad, he met my dad as a young man who was, who actually left his hometown coming to Lagos to see how he can get his career in football career blossom. And that was where they met. And so 
they fell in love and my mom introduced my dad to the family and they said no because you know the royal always wanted to stay with the royal mm. people and they said no and they kicked against it so seriously but my mom made up her mind that she is going to uh, stay with my dad and so that made the whole family the royal family to like she was like i would say disown <laughs> yeah the, mm. that's also disown but my uncle who was a direct elder brother to my mom loved my mom so much and we could see the love when we were growing up as a child whenever we see him you see the affection that he's giving us and the love but it's like a man who wants to stand on his right or stand on his rules and regulation and he's trying to be tough but emotionally you can see the affection so whenever we see him he, that love and that affection you know just surrounding but the wife and some other families we didn't have it easy and so we were like small royal people that was not living the best life mm -hmm. because my, my dad was just a struggler so just a hustler and uh, he tried it's like leaving one place to go to another place and then you want to go get a uh, play football and you don't know anyone and yeah. so that was how my dad ended up playing for a Celeso and also working for a Celeso at the same time. And that was a just a very low division. So he was very quite talented, but no one was able to, you know, to, to link him up. And so he was just working and that's how they got, mar they got married and uh, I, I, I came in existence. And when I came, uh, my dad told me that I just love football from, from a child. Yeah. And my mom, would, my mom would spank me sometimes like, don't play football. I don't want you to get hot. Don't play football. And my dad would like, leave him alone. Let him. <laughs> and my mom would like, your dad didn't make anything good out of it. He was frustrated. Don't play football. <laughs> and so, so that was how I started playing football. And my dad is a real role model to me because I mean, those days in the eighties and the nineties, when we were playing football in the, uh, as a young boy, you don't, you don't, you don't call football a career yeah. in Nigeria specifically. You don't call football a career because uh, then people believe the career is going to school and graduate in university and then get a decent job. Mm -hmm. you know, so football wasn't a career. And those who played football that was, that was hailed or cheered were those who succeeded in coming to the national team. And then when you come up to yeah. the national team, the whole Nigeria will support you. <laughs> yeah, they, they yeah. Your, but as a career it wasn't a career so we had it i really had it tough really what, had it what, tough. was 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 yakini was yakini one of the people that uh that really uh changed the perspective with his with the profile of his career actually uh what really changed the perspective was actually from 94 after 94, the US, 94. Yeah. after the us 94 and in my community as a whole I made a serious, I made a huge change in the community because in the whole community, that community is about 200,000 inhabitants yeah. that were living there. So <clears throat> when I traveled out, it was a, it was like a blow in the eyes of people because I traveled out without playing yeah. the national team. And I also traveled out as a very young boy. We're like, well, how did, how did it happen? And so yeah. That encouraged not only football players, encouraged also, that's where the musicians picked up. I don't know if you know that Nigerian music entertainment industry is a very big one in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where people, all the musicians that you see, most of the Nigerian musicians you see today came out from that community. And yeah. I remember many of them, they used to, when we play, when I was playing, they used to start, they would, they would hang around behind the field and they just clap their hands and cheer us. And then they would, they would just... <laughs> construct their music they were just constructing their music because they were not they were not yeah. known so actually yeah. my my moving out gave a lot of people hope in that community that you can actually something good can come out that's that's really that's really cool actually yeah but that's a that's a very high quality uh that's a very high quality fan support there uh, with a lot of talent yeah. <laughs> so it must it must have been easy to keep your rhythm while playing no but yeah. but but you mentioned 94 i mean that was you know yeah. Everybody was was Cameroon, Cameroon, Cameroon about uh, until '94, and then Nigeria had such a great World Cup in the United States, uh, and then uh, 
you were had you been part of the you've been part of the you'd been part of the youth national team set up then uh, up until then and no. How, no not yet how so tell us how that came about you ended up you how did you end up in in southern italy yes i actually was a very interesting very profound story i i was a very good friend we had this team called Gilos Bega and Gilos Bega used to be Gilos Bega used to be uh the biggest team in Nigeria, they were sponsored by the Germans. Okay, and okay, the yeah, Germans yeah. are the, Julius Bega is the, one of the biggest construction, uh, construction companies. Mm -hmm. they, they used to exchange, Nigeria used to exchange our crude oil as payment to them. So they yeah. were very massive and they were in Lagos. And so they had, so they were very big. So they decided to form a team and they were a very rich team. And so they got a youth team the same way it is in Europe, just a feeders mm -hmm. team, they call it feeders, a youth team. And so that was how we did a screen for over 300 or 400 people came together, young players from different talent. And then we got selected 22, finally 22 list man was selected. And I was one of the, those 22 men. And I was given the captain of the team mm -hmm. because I was very uh, talented. And also during that period also to while we were playing, we play friendly games every time with the A team. Every Tuesday, we play with the A team friendly games, and we were we we did it for like two months, and we were so tough that we we give them tough time, and that the games have to stop <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because they they actually wanted to play with us so we they can so they can you know learn tactics, they can be able to have enough uh, mm -hmm. goal scorings, but that wasn't working. Rather, they they got tough times and. You can see they were bigger than us. And sometimes they use words like, I'll kick you if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Pro professionalism, professionalism. Yeah, they threaten us you know, as young boys. They threaten us as young boys. And so Sondo Lise, younger brother, was in that team as well too. So he was the one benching me. So he was my reserve. Actually, when we, he's my replacement. And he was a quite a good player. So we were good friends and we, we suddenly uh mock you know as football players we joke and we mock ourselves and so you know they had sunday and his family they had this spot on their faces they had like a dark spot yeah. you know on their faces and so some of like my friends with freckles freckles yeah they have this dark spot like freckles yeah exactly and then my friends would say like oh they mocked him and like the bed shit on your face that's why you got the freckles <laughs> so he was my very good friend and then so <laughs> Uh, one day I, I said the same thing, you know, everybody was saying that and that was fine. But that very day when I said the same thing, he got so pissed up and he refused to speak to me for like one month. My God. Yes. And he refused to. Be, so I tried to, I tried to tell him that I was just joking, like a friend, like just a joke. It wasn't anything serious. And he refused to. So one particular day, now I'm coming to how I got the opportunity to come to Europe. So one particular day I got this, we call it puff puff in Nigeria, but it's called donut. You know, yeah. I got these two donuts and mm -hmm. it was like my last meal and my breakfast at the same time. So I wasn't sure of my lunch. Mm -hmm. So, and that was my, that was my last meal. So I got two. So I ate one and it was sitting beside me. So we were just changing. We were dressing up for the next, for our training. And so I, I just suddenly heard something communicate to me and said, Shh, give, give the last one to your friend. And I resisted and I said, no, I heard it three times. And I'm like, no, say, so give it to him. And I said, no, give it to him. And so I stretched my hands, giving it to him. But I also wanted to let him know that I don't want you to take it. I'm like this. <laughs> 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 so, so he grabbed it and just ate it. And he was very hungry. I'm like, so when he grabbed it and ate it, I, I felt I was really touched. So I turned around and looked at him. I'm like, haven't you eaten? Your brother is Sondo Lise, who just newly got signed in Belgium. So Sondo was just newly signed in Belgium. With going, yeah. And I'm like, have you not eaten? But your brother plays professional football. And he's like, no, I have not eaten. And he said, Sunday haven't got a good salary. Whenever he comes back, that's where we have good time. But every time I really struggle. So I felt it. I'm like, oh, I could have given it a long time. I'm like, eat it up. So you see, my heart wasn't, you know, my, my, my my whole action was wrong, but my heart was actually kind enough. So you see, so when he, when I I gave him, he was like, "What are you doing this evening?" I'm like, "What do you mean?" 
and he said, my brother Sunday sent a white, uh, uh, a white scout from Belgium to come scout some players today. And I'm like, if, if what you're telling me right now is because of the donut I gave you, don't give me such hope. Just eat it up and then let it be. Don't give me such hope. And he's like, no, I mean it. And he was like, don't tell anyone here. So we were like more than 65 players over there. Don't let anyone know, just for you. Mm. And exactly, I went that evening, scout from Belgium came, and not now that you have a lot of scouts, scout from Belgium came and we had about 250 players. I was scouted among the six players and I was the one, number one person that was sold that day. And that was how I, get, I left. So the moral of the story is that donuts are not so bad for a professional. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good moral story. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so you ended up, so you landed, so, so, so you, you ended up in Italy. Yes, quick, was, a Belgium scout, yes. was a Belgium scout. So he scouted me and said I was supposed to leave with him that February, but because it's very cold, I didn't know anything about winter, how cold it is. So it's yeah. very cold. <laughs> so I will come in April and then my document will be prepared. And so guess what? I stayed in Nigeria for another two years, but my friend left. So basically what happened was that my place was used, Monopoly. My place was yeah, used to replace. So my good friend who invited me there, who was the brother to Sunday, he left rather, but I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. So he left rather. So I stayed in Nigeria for so for another two years until after the US 94. So now Regina have sold Sunday, they've loaned Sunday to Ajax. So they needed a replacement. Yeah. So they needed a replacement, but they needed someone that is ready in the Super Eagles A team. So the sport director, the late uh, Pierre de Monte is late now. Late Pierre de Monte has to come down to, to, to check that player very well and, and make sure everything was ready. So why they came down, so they invited all the home-based local senior Super Eagles player, people like Precious Mon Monye, John and Neil Conde were very fantastic home-based players. They were mm -hmm. playing for the A team. So they invited them and they were not complete to play against a team. So just selected players from the Super Eagles against a professional team. And that was when the big brother of Sondu Lise, who was the one handling the documentations then, and he's a barrister. And he said, oh, I remember this young boy that I was supposed to, they scouted some years ago yeah. and I was supposed to leave. So he, he called me and said, come be part of this trip. So actually when I came, I played in that game. I scored the one, actually we won 1-0. I was the one who scored the goal actually. And that moment, Pierre de Monte saw me, took the message down to, to Italy and said, you need to see this young talent. And that was how they said they wanted me. And Chochi said, no, I'm not ready. I'm still young. And they said, no, he must get me this time around. Yeah. And that was how. How old were you? Uh, I, was, was I was actually 17. Then yeah. when I came to Italy, I uh, was young. going to 18 actually. Your mom, your mom must have been very stressed. No, my mom died actually. My mom died oh, very okay. early also too. My mom died very early also too. My mom died. And so it, it's, it's, it's was my mom died long when I was like seven years old. My mom died. She died. Yeah, she was sick, seriously ill. I didn't know. I didn't know uh, Prince actually. Oh. Um, but that's, uh, yeah. So she, uh, she must have been stressed watching from heaven. Yeah, so my 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 dad was totally everything. He was the role model. He was there. Mm -hmm. He would come. He was even fired. My dad got fired in his workplace because he used to make yes. a shift, shift all the time. When he's working in the morning, he makes a shift in the evening. It's not like he miss, he's missing his job, but always shifting. And so the mm -hmm. manager came and was very jealous. Like, are you the only one who's got a son? Every time you're going to watch his son, yeah. every time you want to see his son, go home and rest. So he got fired. But I remember when my dad... Uh, com completed his uh, his uh, his apartment, his, his villa where he lives. He, he invited that same manager, and also, yeah, uh, he saw saw my dad and was very proud. Was very proud. Because what was it like growing up in that community? You said where football wasn't seen as a career. Uh, coming from New Zealand myself, you know, I can also relate a little bit to that in my own experience. 
like what was that like mentally for you were you just so set and driven that it just didn't even cross your mind or how was that feeling growing up when that wasn't yeah seen as a, a career that you could earn money from was just the passion and that's what I tell a lot of young players it was just the passion because I had this I had this passion for football even during my high school days I had a passion I I was very very good in my uh, early, we call it primary, you know, mm -hmm. primary school. I was very, very good in class. I was, I was always on top. And then when I get to the high, my high school days, my my result was not really. I just managed to finish because I was so passionate in football. Mm -hmm. You know, I was so passionate in football, and that neighborhood, the community, was so a rough community. But now today, people call it AJ City. That's what is used to. They name it a city right now, and mm -hmm. because so many talents, so many. Uh, celebrities came out of that place and now everybody wants to associate themselves to be called from that area but during my days when you say you're from that neighborhood you're like cast out mm -hmm. you know yeah. so I used to go around when I go around I see boys hanging uh having some marijuana see a lot of uh criminalities you know a lot of uh pickpockets and a lot of uh prostitutions and all those uh wrong stuff that you see in communities mm -hmm. uh, but I was I remember I was so passionate that I would I would trek I would trek from like Stockholm all the way from like Stockholm all the way to 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 Mashta you see the distance I would trek like 50 50 kilometers I would trek 50 kilometers 45 kilometers 60 kilometers yeah. just trekking but and, would you have people when you're growing up like tell you like it's it's not realistic you're never going to make it and yeah. and how did yeah, what was your response? How did you deal with it? It's just fact, the area, the street where I stayed. I know a lot of women that used to sit down. They have this small kiosk where they sell some groceries. And, you know, mm. I hear them say words when I'm coming back from training. I hear them say words. This guy is useless. This guy doesn't have anything to do with his life. They they say it like mm. I, they they basically say it so I can hear. And so that was how frustrated it was to the extent that when I'm going to football game, I had to put my football shoes not in a bag but in a polythene bag. Like I went to, like I went to buy some grocery for my father. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's that's really it's really fascinating, and 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 uh, and I think so many people can relate to that. Uh, some can't, but I think they're in the minority. But 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 at the same time, the, the the magnitude. I mean, we think about the 1990s, and then we think about how many fantastic. Just forget the rest of Africa, mm. uh, forget the rest of the developing world. You know, South America, etc. Mm. Just think about how many fantastic talents came out, and what what you're saying it is that they were hobbyists. <laughs> there were people who were following their passions, and that made them really really good players because you couldn't keep them off the football pitch. They would walk 50 kilometers per day or 40 kilometers per day to yes. play. Yes. That makes a huge difference. But, but it's so it's so interesting as well, because like a little funny story about myself is I came from a little football academy from New Zealand. But, you know, for example, I came to Europe with a player called Ryan Thomas, who's now at PSV and one mm -hmm. called Tyler Boyd, who's now at uh, Besiktas in Turkey. Mm -hmm. But we all attended the same school. And mm -hmm. the school uh, basically said, if you want to be in the sports program, you have to play a winter sport, which mm -hmm. of course was football, yes. and a summer sport, which in New Zealand could be cricket, could be That's you right. know, uh, athletics or something along those lines. But at that time, we were so focused. We said, football is, is it. We play football. That's it. you know. And anyway, long story short, all three of us got kicked out of the sports program. The, the, the head of the sports of the school all sent us all sent us a full page letter saying basically only 1% of footballers make it from New Zealand. You're never going to make it professionally. And it's unbelievable. All three of us have become professional football players. And I have the letter still on my on my wall in my bedroom in New Zealand. It's <laughs> it's it's amazing how you know how people can speak without the knowledge you know and and it is it is that mindset that kind of drives you forward and 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 keeps you stronger also when you're going through your playing career as well yeah yeah it's it's fascinating and then 
and then you have players who were born into a into a famous footballing family, had all the money, all the resources, trained on the pitches of FC Barcelona, got signed for Manchester United because of their name. I'm thinking about Jordi Cruyff. Sorry, yeah, he's <laughs> there, for example. But but you know, and then, and then they don't make it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't make it to, to what what people were expecting of them. It's quite a fascinating. Um, you were one of the players uh, which went to Europe in that wave uh, in in 1994, but it wasn't just Nigeria because it was it was uh, there was fantastic set of new territories that European clubs started to recruit recruit from, and I think Italy was at the time the best league in the world. Yes. We forget that already, but in 1994, Italy was considered number best. one unchallenged. No, no comparison. <laughs> Uh, but that's true, and, and and then it was you know you you had you had the reputation of people like Okocha coming on you uh, in four years before Boli had had lifted the fans of Italy with Cameroon. Yes. Uh, so you 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 suddenly became probably an African for the first time from a Nigerian, right? Yes. Because there was this there was this new excitement. Uh, uh, you know, and, and it kept on going. You had the the, the you had Senegal's uh, and El Hadji Diouf, and you had the 200, 2010 Ghana in South Africa that that lifted the fantasy of the whole world. But um, I'm I'm asking you here as an as, a, as an African footballer, mm. what elements uh, from your from your period mm -hmm. could be better harnessed to to help young footballers take the step. Because now there's a whole industry. It's a different environment. Yeah. Uh, it's just to uh, psychologically uh, muscle building this young talent in this component, I will say. Uh, because right now, the environment, you have everything that you can. I mean, for example, I, I, I have the young ones in my, uh, just beside me, my sons right now. I, I not only Manuel, but his younger brothers, Shalom, and the, the 11 year old that are playing for BP, the academy already. So they have everything. They have, sometimes they have the, 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 they have the best boots, they have the best shoes, they, they have the best clothes, they, they, they have the best species. And, and, but getting them to, getting them to, to strive and train and develop and develop and develop and also to train their muscles also to, to be strong is a, is a challenge. And, but that has to be, players have to be, young players have to understand that now when you talk to a lot of young players, they just like how much you earn when you're doing your playing yeah. days. That's the first thing they ask you. How much do you earn when you're playing? And they talk about the money, you see, you, you need to be very passionate in football as a career first, and then the money comes. And until you are not, until you are passionate, you, you will only be on the surface. You will only be on the surface. We've seen a lot of young players who play football, but never, they never amount to anything because when it comes to that area of being passion, passionate enough, they, they missed it. I, I, I can say, I can say myself, playing in the 90s that that money wasn't as important as when I talk mm -hmm. to player, players right now and and and, uh, and 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 you know you you had you took a path which wasn't a, even recognized as a career people thought you could never earn enough money on it mm -hmm. and then uh, and nowadays you the moment you've you've you've, be, you've joined into any level of senior football you want a salary whatever it is it's like uh, it's a very sharp contrast that's right yeah. Jesse, Jesse's going to take you through the rapid fire questions. <laughs> yes, Brent. So the rapid fire questions is basically a section of short questions with short answers. Mm. Okay, so we're going to begin that now by asking who was your favorite player growing up? Roberto Baggio. <laughs> and you got to go to his hometown, uh, around his hometown <laughs> later. So that's. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Vincenzo. <laughs> that was off air, Tony. Off air. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Dimaggio and Luther Matthias in Germany. <laughs> Who was the best manager you've played for? Uh, actually, uh, I had two. I will say uh, I had uh, Carlos Ancelotti and uh, Roland Nielsen. 
who is the best player that you've played with? Fernando Di Napoli. He who played together with Maradona in Napoli, who was the, the same midfield. He was playing to, uh, uh, midfield together with uh, Diego Armando Maradona. Unbelievable, Classic. unbelievable. And then you paired, and then you partnered with him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Did you ever meet Maradona Prince? No, I never met him. Okay. But I had so much. I, I the stories I had already from Fernando in Napoli is already enough. It's like uh, uh, it was so much. It was unending stories, unending. And yeah. Fernando in Napoli then in Italy, he was a very, he was a very massive player. So he, it's through him I saw Ferrari for the first time. He, you know, he drove mm -hmm. Ferrari, Lamborghini, <laughs> you know, and he was really, he was really helping me out as a young player. He was really helping me out in being a constructive midfielder. And he was a, a great ball passer. <laughs> and I know after, you know, your playing career, you've moved into, you know, also a mentorship role and also into some coaching. Who is uh, the best player you've coached or had as a, or you've mentored? I've mentored Obafemi Martins. I wow. mentored Ayodele Makinwa, who played for Lazio. Yeah. Uh, I mentored Kennedy Bonike. Yeah. yeah. I mentored all, mostly all the Nigerians that you, or Joey Gallo, I mentored him. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yes I, I, I meant so many Nigerian national team players. Uh, I I mentored them a lot. Yes, Akim Latif names in Norway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so many of them. If I start to name them, you will be so amazed. Mm. <laughs> oh, it, is, it is amazing. I mean, we could just have a podcast with you naming these guys because. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, so I, mean, I mentor. I mean, I mentor basically Obafemi Martins from 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 the onset. Mm. And I made him not take stupid decisions, mm. stupid decisions that wouldn't have made him uh, uh, successful today. Are, are, are you, are you, are you being, are you, did you learn how to do it well from your father? Did he help you out in that way? My dad was actually a very good uh, model, he was a very disciplined man. And he taught me a lot of things, taught me how to cook, taught me how to uh, 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 get myself, he taught me neatness. He's a very neat man, very, very sharp. He's always looking sharp. He's 74 years old. He taught me how to dress. He taught me so many stuff and he taught me so many family upbringing. And he was a really, really, really role model. And uh, he taught me life, you just need to stay on the good side, just do good stuff. <laughs> yeah. But that's really important. I, you know, in, in my opinion that, uh, you know, it's really important and, and you know, sometimes happens by accident that you are, are surrounded in, in a good environment. And that is also with the friends you have, also the family you have, you know, and some people are unfortunate with that and sometimes in the, in the life they grew up in. Yes. But in terms of, you know, having these dreams of being a professional football player, if you fall into the wrong, wrong environment or wrong group, it's very easy at a at a young age, especially in this environment, when there is money being thrown around at people who haven't even achieved anything yet, that it's very hard to stay on the path because the path of consistency is what makes you great, you know, and what brings you up the levels. And, and it's very difficult for, you know, players because you're not always, uh, it's not always a choice, you know, which, which group you're, you're born and raised in, you know, and that's, right. and that's, that's, that's crucial that you sur surround yourself in the right people, because the people who you surround yourself in are the people who you're most going to be like in the future. To me, your friends, and I'll tell you who you are, that's, it mm. really matters a lot, really matters. Mm. And a lot of young, a lot of young players, and uh, they really actually need that. They really need yeah. that. They need to, sometimes you're born, uh, I, I always say you can be you can be born disadvantaged, but you were not created to be disadvantaged. Mm. It, and the prince, with uh, with through like researching before starting this podcast, we've seen a lot of your highlights. Oh and yeah. We have to say there's some there's some crazy things in there. <laughs> but what is your your favorite or best goal that you have scored? Wow, that that goal was not. Those goals were not recorded actually. 
and I'm still looking. I've got quite a number of cities, and I'm still trying to convert them and watch them. And those girls were in China. Mm -hmm. I score. I score. I mean, my I, I had my best playing days also too in my super. My you know I was I was quite and a very offensive player during my days. And people, when I tell people that I'm very offensive, very fast, they're like, oh, with the kind of football you play lately, we didn't know that you were that fast. I was so quick. When mm. I, I mean, when I when I just take off, I take off, I, I just go. And in, during my days in Italy, I was the only player. One time when I got uh, captainship uh, in, the, in the team, I was the youngest player, 24 years old. And then they asked the coach why he gave me the captain. And normally in Italy, you know, you have this cultural stuff, cultural stuff that mm. the old ones always get the captainship. Mm. And so, but for the first time, the coach gave it to a 24 years old guy. And he said, because I am the only player and they call me Ipke in Italy, not Prince, Ipke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they said, they say, the coach said, because he's the only player that I use everywhere and anytime I need to switch player. So I was playing left back. I was playing right back. I was playing central defense. I was playing central midfield. I was playing left winger, uh, left midfield. I was playing right midfield. I was playing offensive, yeah, supporting, striking. I was everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> not, not goalkeeping, not goalkeeping. Not goalkeeping, no. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk us through then your favorite goal that you've scored? Do you have well, one in, in particular China. that, that well, China, really sticks well, in your mind? Yes, it was in China. I actually moved past five players. I dribbled past five players. And basically from, from, from my half, I took the ball and I just dribbled past five players and I all the way dribbled the goalkeeper. I just shot the ball. <laughs> I can help you. I can help you get your, those CDs up on YouTube when you're. I when would you're be so I glad. Want, I, I want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so you get you get them on your computer. I'll get them on YouTube for you. <laughs> I'll be so glad. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned donuts, Prince. What's your favorite uh, meal? <laughs> <laughs> Donut is my is my best snacks though, and I won't <laughs> forget that. <laughs> I can I can forget that. My I, my favorite meal that I love so much is, uh, I've got this traditional soup in uh, in Nigeria. It's called Edikaikon, and it's made mm -hmm. with uh, spinach, a lot of spinach, and it's cooked fresh. You cook it and you just eat it up. Just almost steamed. Yes, you cook it and you just eat it up with a lot of, uh, uh, you cook it fresh. It's quite mm -hmm. expensive because you have all the, you have all the, some of those spices and some of those uh, mm -hmm. exported uh, ingredients that are very expensive though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're very expensive and then, also, spaghetti fruta di mare, which is seafood, is. <laughs> I, when I see that, I, like, wow. I see the passion in your face, Prince. Wow. Well. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> What's your favorite film? Yes, my favorite movies are in inspiration movies, mm -hmm. uh, documentations, movies that are very inspirational. I love those kind of movies. Do you have uh, any one in particular that kind yes, of? Yes, Michael Jordan. I, have my, I love the one Michael mm. Jordan. Yeah. Yes. The recent one, uh, the Last Dance. Yes. Yes. Oh, it's yes. a fantastic. Yeah, it's a yes. fantastic Very series. Good. Who's your favorite current international player? Yes, I would say, for me, I will pick uh, Ndidi. 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 I will pick Ndidi, mm -hmm. and also, I will pick. Uh, If we're talking about, uh, are you in general or just Nigerian players? No, it could be. It could. It could be in general. It could be from any country, any nation. Okay, I will pick Messi. Mm -hmm. I like him so much. I will pick Ronaldo. I will pick Neymar. I will pick uh, Didi. I will pick uh, uh, this young boy uh, Uwachu in Genk. Okay. Okay. That's a full Thanks team, Prince. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> who are your favorite? Who are your favorite sixteen for a team? Not. <laughs> I like their different characters as also players, yeah. not just as players, but also how they've maintained consistency. 
who's who's a very promising Nigerian and you uh, player? Well, any tips? I've got a young player that is very promising right now, but nobody uh, is not known yet. His name is Uche Tami. <coughs> very promising, very very promising striker, and actually. I'm going home to have a talk with him. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm leaving this week to have a talk. He's a super promising young Nigerian player that the whole world should look at for. <laughs> Interesting. Looking forward. <laughs> um, next, Obafemi Martins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, this guy. <laughs> but we need to get hold of him and put him down because he's, uh, yeah. He needs to be talked to also too. Yeah. But this is now I'm gonna now I'm gonna ask you a bad question. So if you were to change your nationality in soccer, in yes. football, uh, what would it be? Uh, I mean Italy. Ghana, for example. Italy. Oh uh, Italy. Okay, not Ghana. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tony's fishing. I'm fishing, I'm fishing, I'm bite. fishing. <laughs> Speculating. <laughs> Italy. So it, it, that would have been they played a very wonderful Italian, I Italians, I mean, that was the first country I landed and it helps me so much in football, mm -hmm. constructively, constructively, tactically, mentally also too, because when I left, I left my whole family. I was like, the first week I was like, I need to go back. I must go back. I can't mm -hmm. do this. I can't do this. And I have to speak to myself, but this is what you plan for. This is what you vote for. This is what you've always been talking about. Now you've got it. So, and suddenly I met a wonderful uh, uh, Canabinieri family, yeah. <laughs> police, yeah. Yeah. police family who was living in Reggio Emilia and they accepted me. Wow, what a wonderful family. And I'm looking forward to go back and, and just hug this family. And they accepted me, they brought me in and they begin to, you know, they make me feel at home because Regina never knew they never knew what I was going in, what I was mentally, how I was troubled. Mm -hmm. I was troubled. They never knew how I was troubled. And they were just seeing me play for say, Tuto, Tuto Bene, Tuto Bene. I would just shake my head, Tuto Bene. Yeah. Tuto Bene. Tuto Bene. Yeah. Yeah. Tuto Bene. But deep inside, I was really lonely. Mm. I was really lonely. In that yeah. Villa Granata, we call it Villa Granata, where you keep all the young players and you know, and I wasn't speaking the language. You, you guess what? So, so, but I learned in three months, I adjusted, and uh, in six months, I started communicating in Italian language. Mm. And life became, I learned so much tactics. And it was like university. I remember those early days. I'm like, early days when the tactics is going on, I'm like, is this football or university? Is this football or, or uh, is this? Yeah. We sit for one hour, 20 minutes, just board walk, two hours, <laughs> no, just board walk. Yeah. Two hours, but work. You sit there, and then, and then I will just be taking nap, and then my teammate will be like, "You need to help yourself." I'm like, well, "How do I help myself? I'm struggling. I am, I'm feeling dizzy. Like, drink coffee, and that, that's where they introduce me to espresso. <laughs> <laughs> espresso. Uh, that's it. That's it. Nothing else left. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but they're they're in they're in Italy. You know, tactic tactics are so important in the Italian game, as well as I think as well. You must have experienced the fitness uh, of preseason in Italy is another level compared um, to what. Yeah. Retiro, yeah. retiro, we call it. Oh, retiro, yeah. Run we were in the in... forest, Tony. You need to run the forest and yeah. run around oh. the mountain. I'm like, unbelievable! Is the is the worst period. I had well, a coaching. It, it, I, I am the enemy. I had a coaching experience in Italy. <laughs> oh, yes, we went up to uh, what do you call this place? Uh, Trentino in the mountains. That's yes, where I live. Trentino. Oh, that, that's if I, I see, if I, I see, if I even see this lake we were running around again, I will automatically feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably you're probably running around Lago Pergine, I imagine. Oh, it's the worst period for football players. All, all of the preseason, all of the preseason happens there, and it's it's at a thousand two hundred meters altitude. But then, like the elite teams, they go up to two thousand meters, or like yeah. one thousand eight hundred, and they do the running up there. Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. But then, even even as well, like going back tactically, uh, where I came from in New Zealand, it was quite uh, free playing. So if the coach 
had a game, of course, he would be instructing you, but it would be free playing in training, you know. And in Italy, every second, Jesse, not here, three inches to the right, you know, and he would be playing Lego, you know. He would yeah. be playing Lego, but it's, it's very important over there. And also, yeah. uh, in terms of myself being a defender, mm. uh, the learning was second to none. I think Italy was one of the best places I could go and learn the art of defending. Unbelievable. Yes, it was unbelievable. And our coach was also uh, a former player for Lazio. He played mm. over 200 games for Lazio, and he was also a center defender. So to learn off these these people and, and in this environment was, was an amazing experience, even mm. though it was very tough because yeah. of the language barrier culturally it's very different yeah. but as you said you know when you start to learn the language everything becomes a lot easier i think tony you you guys should you guys should italy italians should i know they are not speaking english is actually a serious barrier for a lot of coaches i mean italian fa should do something they should in, they should impact countries and coaches a lot in tactics mm -hmm. these guys are they are amazing when it comes to tactical football. They, they do, and, and they've reinvented themselves, so they have impacted. I mean, they've reinvented themselves, the Italian, the, Ita the, Ita the entire Italian game uh, went to the three-man backline setups that the world is using right now. I mean, I mean again, because they're, they're, the catenaccio wasn't working anymore. 4-4-2 mm -hmm. uh, wasn't working anymore. 4-3-3 wasn't working anymore. So, they, so they, you had the, the innovators, but I mean, uh, people like Zaccheroni or or people like uh, Gasparini, and Gasparini's Gasparini's not not he's not known worldwide, mm. but but you have co top coaches watching him and learning from him. Mm. You know, I mean, what he's done with Atalanta Bergamo. So definitely, there's a lot that. But what what would if you would if you had to change sport, what sport would you change? What sport would you coach in? Basketball. Basketball, okay. <laughs> basketball, basketball or basketball or boxing. I used to do I used to do boxing when I was uh, very young. I, I was very committed in it and until I the area where we were actually doing the boxing, uh, uh, that that area was shut down. And so I I I paid more attention to football. I was very good also in handball. I played national, I played for national team under under eleven. Under twelve, humble Nigeria. So I was very, I was very athletic, very good in in sport, and I was running long distance. I was good in long distance race because I've got a good condition, and that's why in Italy, I remember in Italy in Calasanchelo to we I run, and they would just tell me, "Tranquilo, tranquilo, ferma, 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 ferma." You know, in the Cooper, yeah, the Cooper test, you know, the yeah. yo-yo test. We do yo-yo yeah. test, and yeah. I was just running and running, and everybody's down, everybody's mm -hmm. locked down. And I would just say, ferma, ferma, tranquilo, ferma, ferma. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way, that's the way. Uh, now, my father, my father, who was a boxer, used to say, uh, the only thing that matters about a boxer are their feet. You look, you watch their feet, that's how you tell a good boxer. That's right. But Nigerian fighting, especially in the current climate, you know, is, is definitely rising, you know, obviously with AJ, uh also in mma with uh israel adesanya hmm. yes and uh you know there's some really prominent fighters coming out of yeah. nigeria now as AJ, well three of them yes the yes. three of them are really doing well anthony joshua as well too yeah so anthony we've joshua, got yeah. like four nigerians in mma and uh boxing and they are really kick but they are really doing very well they're yeah. doing very well unbelievable yes prince if the if the if the grocery ladies had their way and if they would have made you quit, what would you be doing instead of football? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. <laughs> Where would you be? <clears throat> Where would I be? <laughs> of football. Where would I be instead of football? <laughs> when I was when I was when I was when I was growing up as a young boy, I I dreamt of being a doctor. Actually, mm -hmm. I dreamt of being a doctor. But I when I got into football, I realized that. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a spiritual doctor right now. <laughs> so, so I'm still a doctor, but in another, <laughs> another field. And so, soul doctor, soul doctor. Yes, and those, those women, those ladies, guess what? I go down every year 
and I've changed the whole community has changed. And when they see me, many of them are still alive today and they've pushed, they are literally, they are literally, they have to like push their children to go play football. You know, you must play football. <laughs> must play football. I remember my, my French mistress in, in school. She faced me one day, she was coming in the class in French and I was just working out. Every time she comes in is when we have the school national team with school training. So when she's coming in, I'm going out. <laughs> she's coming in, I'm going out. She's coming in. And then one day she stopped me and said, you, you will never make it in life. <laughs> you will never make it in life. You will do struggle. Football, football, football. You'll never make it in life. And I just laughed and I went. And then many years ago, my his, his son, who was my classmate, was wedding. And so I was, I was invited. So I flew down. And so when I flew down, I was playing in national team. So when I flew down, I had the fans, you know, you had the fans who were following me and they, you know, a lot of chanting in, in the wedding. So the wedding got distracted. The wedding got distracted as well. I'm like, yeah. so I sneaked in and everybody got distracted. And she was like, oh, have, and the mom, she came, I'm like, I've been looking for you. I, I saw you on TV. I saw you this. <laughs> she gave me a hug and like, can you carry my other, my other son? Can you take him to him? Make him to him? I said, no, no. He will not make it. <laughs> it's funny how the world comes around, eh? Yeah, I wish you could wish you could show up and buy her a bouquet of flowers, no? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but as well, uh, Prince, obviously in a football career, it's not always ups. Obviously, in a football career, there's also downs and setbacks. And it's about how we can even that keel a little bit so the highs are not too high and the lows are not too low that's very important in in my opinion but we're going to talk about if you have ever had a, a failure or an apparent failure that has set you up for later success or in other words do you have a favorite failure of yours i i the failure one of the failures beginning from like i said when i was supposed to have left nigeria 1990, I was supposed to have left in 1991, actually, while mm. I was still in school. <laughs> I would have left, that was when I was scouted, but I didn't go because my, my place was used. Someone replaced me and I don't know what happened, but definitely <clears throat> I knew something happened and that wasn't mm. good. And it was some kind of manipulation. So for me, I felt sick and I got sick. I got hit by fever, uh, malaria. I didn't know where it came from. <laughs> I got I got sick and uh, some kind of flu because mentally, uh, mentally I wasn't okay and I felt like the whole wall is crumbling on me because I was a young passionate football player who got the opportunity and because I wasn't I didn't have anyone to speak for me so it was stolen away from me so I felt the whole world was crumbling on me so what I was a big for me it was a big setback and but. I managed to, to get up and it affected my football for a couple of weeks because when I'm playing, you see, I wasn't trying to, I, I wasn't, I wasn't into, into football the way I was not having those kind of, those uh, display that I used to have for a couple of weeks and months actually. And I had to take, a, uh, I had to take a, some time break and uh, regain myself psychologically when I picked up and I've had several Failures also to in like in the national team, the time that I was supposed to pick up in the 19, 1990, when Ronaldo was discovered, 1997, mm. under 21 World Cup. I don't know if you guys remember in Nigeria, 19, Nigeria 99. Yeah. Nigeria 99. Uh, 99. Yeah, yeah, yes. 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 Ronaldo came from Brazil, and that, that national team, I was given the captain. I was the captain because I'm already mm. playing in Regina then already. And so I was given the captain of the team, but I went back and I got injured. And that was where Gilos Agahua was discovered. Yeah. And Gilios, uh, for me, I was the star boy of that very team. And so mm -hmm. then Nigeria could have known me, uh, the whole Nigeria could have. So it's been long that uh, Nigerians would have known uh, me actually for long. But somehow these times I, I used to have these little injuries and these little setbacks. And, you know, I remember also to 1998, I came to Denmark. Uh, 1998, I came to Denmark. I came to Manmo, but nobody knew. I came to Manmo. Manmo loved me so much, and they wanted to get me away from uh, from Regina because I was sent here on loan. 
1998. I was sent here on loan in Sweden. And so I came, I trained with the team Manmo, and they loved me so much. And we wanted to strike the deal, but it didn't, somehow it didn't work. And I had to go back to Italy. And uh, so those little setbacks, those were my... And, and what, what did you take from those experiences that say later on, looking back now, that that has have given you some success from those tough times because obviously you know there's some soul searching in there you have to go into a deeper place and you find out more about yourself in those difficult times what what do you think is has come out of those situations for yourself personally yes has made me mentally strong also to also know that once you've got the once you've got the quality you just need to sometimes it doesn't happen the way, the time you want them to happen. Mm. Sometimes life need time. Mm. And time, uh, uh, time will be constructed in a geographical location as well too. So, so it things doesn't happen the way you want them to happen at your time. But those things, uh, it's like falling into water doesn't make you drown. It's when you cannot rescue yourself. That's when you become drowned. So, so you don't fail when you fail. You fail when you can't get up. You fail when you don't succeed. So, so there are a lot of things that are challenges in life, and those things. Some people quit along the way, but some people get it get them stronger. And that's where people need to learn and come up to that part where you know, oh, this is what makes me stronger. This can actually has been a challenge in my life, and I can actually use this to spring to the next level. I really like how you said that. You, you, you. you... You don't fail when you fail. You fail when you don't get up. Yeah, that's, that's very uh, well articulated as well. So, Prince, you worked and played with and for some very influential football players and managers throughout your career so far. What knowledge of or piece of advice did you gain from working with such influential people and, and what really comes to your mind or sticks, sticks with you? What sticks with me is the development and sometimes you always have a talent sometimes you have like for example when i came to italy i was a very talented player but uncle ancelotti called me and spoke to me and just showed me just little just little he was a midfielder mm. you yeah. know so so you can see the interest he was a midfielder and he loved me so much and he gave me the first professional contract i remember sitting in front of him and that was his time of springing as well too because he's a radio emilia boy born and brought up in yeah, Rachel Hill. Right. So Regina gave him that opportunity because he's, he's their homeboy. And mm. also he's been a very good coach. And also, so it was his time of his peak. And so he called me and said, look, son, you, you, you're a very good player, but guess what? This is what you do. Sometimes get the ball, release it, and just make, just, just adjust a little bit and get the ball again. And then you can see why that. So just little, just little tips are uh, what I call experience that actually knowledgeable uh, that helps me to develop as a player so uh, knowledge actually make you become more experienced what well, they always say as well it's a famous quote that knowledge is power makes you more experienced yeah what you don't know will always always would be bigger than you what you mm. don't know is bigger than you all, all of this, all of this, uh, all of this is valuable for the next uh, next question, which I'm going to ask you because uh, your son Emmanuel, he's a he's a really talented, smart, offensive player, uh, playing with Empoli's youth team and 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 being involved with the Swedish uh, with the Swedish uh, youth setup. Uh, I, I've asked you about how it's different for the youth today. Uh, I've met Emmanuel. I've had the privilege of meeting Emmanuel. Uh, I was really impressed by his person, but. I can't even begin to ask how different his world is from yours, but but can you can you reinvent all that you've learned for his context, which is completely different from your context? I mean, it's very very different. There's no 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 use comparing it. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. What what advice could you give him in his context? In his context, what what would do every what would do me and Emmanuel? What would do is that every game we do analysis. And so what it does is that every game he calls me and said that uh, I want you to watch my game and tell me how I can get better. Great. And he's a very humble boy, very disciplined and very hardworking. And in fact, yesterday he sent me a video and I said, Emmanuel, 
it's not enough with your talent. I still need you to develop yourself every day, which means develop the, your weak side and improve and get better with your, with your strengths. And he sent me a video yesterday and I was very impressed. And I said, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so proud of you, son. He sent me a video. He went outside uh, uh, before training and did just 40 minutes personal training and shooting on his left foot, shooting on his left foot and making some movement and sent me the video to show that he actually did that. Fantastic. 40 minutes, it's good session. And then through saying that, would what is a piece of advice that you would give to other parents with similarly talented children to become professionals? I will, I will tell the parents, look, you can't do anything to improve their football apart from you encouraging them mm -hmm. to be committed. But there's something that you can do to every football player is to build their muscles, mind muscles. And, and, and I would say, and I always say, it, a lot of players, all the players that I've been mentoring professionally, they ask me, they always ask me, and they're like, you're saying the same thing all the time. I'm like, yes, I say the same thing all the time because I know that area is a very critical area, which means you need to be very self-confidence in football. I mean, I've seen, I played with so many great players, so many great players, but whenever we come into the field, they disappear. They just vanished. Why they vanish? Not because they're not good players, but because they've lost their self-confidence. Mm. And so confidence, self-confidence makes you to express your ability, no matter the kind of potentials you have when you are not self-confidence, when you are not confident. And there's so many things that can scare you out. Your opponents can scare you out. What your teammates are saying can scare you out. The game, the situation, that moment can scare you out. But that moment, you build your mind, your mind muscles. When your mind muscles is built, as whatever you train, whatever you develop as a person will be used in the field. Yeah. I, and that's one of my gifts. I didn't, it's a, you, you've, you've, you've been familiar a little bit. You've had some contact also with, with, uh, mm -hmm with the sponsors for for this podcast, which is the Game Insight, which is a platform for developing the careers and potential of players by educating their mind. Mm -hmm. So so definitely uh, uh, that's one of the core values that we want, mm -hmm. that Game Insight wants to portray. But that was, it's very interesting that, that uh, so, so how would you, Prince, how would you, how would you categorize if you're saying that that the mind comes first how would you categorize i just want to spell it out a little bit from mm. your perspective how would you categorize different levels in the game uh, yes well i'm not uh, actually what i'm saying i'm not i'm not actually raising the mind above every other aspect what i'm saying is that it's a very critical area that people need to an individual needs to be developed for example what would you say to a young talent who've got the talent and JC asks the question, what is the advice you give to parents? Uh, it's like, it's like parents talking to the son, that, look, don't be scared. Don't worry. Just, just, just enjoy, just enjoy the game for the moment. And have you realized that every time you enjoy the game, you realize that you're having fun actually. But when you are, I remember those days when people, when coaches are talking and they talk about they, they make so much emphasis on the opponents and make less emphasis on your abilities. You end up, have you realized that what you hear more is what you become? You end up thinking more on the opponents. So those things are quite good, but also we also need to learn to develop players in their mind muscles as well too, because those players, whatever talent they are good with, if their minds are not strong, they will have, uh, and we thank good, good enough. We have good enough. We have came insight in Sweden. I've, uh, Tony, I know you guys. Have the innovation, the the tactical aspect, you know, the tactical aspect, the the movement, you know, and all that. Those are very, very essential uh, because one move also too can make can make a difference in the football. One just uh, right move. 
And then but, even but, further on from that about the consistency with it as well. Yes. Because while you're training and in, in whatever you do, you have circuits of your brain that are connecting to your muscles. So the, the education is important and, mm -hmm. and the consistency is what builds the insulation of mm -hmm. those circuits in your brain. Cool. So the more that you repeat something within the right environment and the right intensity, mm -hmm. that is the stronger and the, the stronger the connections are going to be firing in your muscles. That's right. And then going back to what you were saying a little bit about, you know, really talented players coming into an arena and disappearing. Uh, there's a study about high performance athletes and, and people that perform on the, the big stage and, and they talk about flow states, mm. which there's other words for it in, in music. It's called being in the pocket. In sports, it's more known as being in the zone. Mm -hmm. And it's basically removing the frontal cortex of your brain which is associated mm -hmm. with emotions and everything like this and going into more of the back part of your brain which mm -hmm. is the computer part of your brain yes and that's where all those circuits are and the emotions mm -hmm. get in the way and block those circuits so mm -hmm. the quicker that you can find a way to work into your training and what mm -hmm. you've done in your past and you've learned and block out emotions i think even yourself maybe in games you've not realized how time is going things yes. are in slow motion yes. you know that is that is a, a classic experience of being in a flow state mm. and 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 really you know there's a lot of ways that players help to get in these states through prayer mm. through meditation through even music you know and and mm. and that is something that that players and people of high performance can can maybe be a little bit better on from a younger age mm. and start to learn these these areas of of high performance mm. True. Have you, prince have you have you uh have you ever seen some bad advice uh that that you hear in football that you would tell people not to follow if you think of any bad <laughs> bad advice <laughs> besides eating donuts <laughs> back to the donuts again tony <laughs> 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 you have this. Uh, uh, there is, there is, there, there are, there are coaches, for example, that uh, that will tell you, uh, for example, when it's game building, and and then they tell you, take it easy, take it easy, take it easy, and then you get one opportunity that a player sees a very creative space, and then he puts the ball directly there, and and he attacks immediately. And then the, the striker gets the ball and then finish. And the coach is like, no, 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 not now. Don't do it. They're just take it easy. Take it easy. <laughs> like, it's, like, it's, like telling a, it's like telling a player, it's like telling a player, when you see the opportunity, don't use it. Just <laughs> eat it. <laughs> yeah. and, and I see that a lot in Sweden. Mm -hmm. I see that a lot in Sweden because of the constructive game or game plan that coaches are, some coaches are building, but that's the highest. I would say that's the that's that's the stupidity in 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 the highest level because you don't a player don't players don't players don't have this day when they see the opportunity automatically they use them. It's an automatic thing. It's not something that you. It's like it's like saying I'm let's 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 construct let's construct and then I have a space to go. I'm like. No, I'm not. I'm not going to use it because I need to be constructive. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, I, I've yeah. I've spent I've, after my last decade uh, in Swedish football that really resonates with me. But it's not only Swedish football, but definitely this. Uh, why, why not capitalize on the momentum, on the actual situation, <laughs> which is what uh, we're talking about training game intelligence, which is all about seizing moments and recognizing them, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Um, define success, Prince. What is the definition of success? So, the, the, for me, definition of success is you accomplishing assignment that you that you're giving or that you have. Let me say, for example, if a coach goes to a very small village or countryside or a clown area and the people that are living there and that coach is 
let's use football. We're talking about football now. Let's use football, for example, as an example. And that coach is a developer and has a passion to develop young kids. And in that village, you only have 20 kids in that village. And the coach decided to be there and develop these kids and develop them and impacted them so well. For me, it doesn't matter another coach being in some way else and developing 5,000 people, that same coach with 11 players, 11 kids have achieved his success. So success is achieving what the area geographically and the zone where you are given and being accomplished. Mm. Um, money. Uh, what purchase of $100 or less uh, has positively impacted your life in the last six months? Come again. What, what have you, Prince, what have you purchased, bought for $100 or 100 euros or 1,000 crowns or less recently in the last couple of months books. that has positively impacted your month? Books. Okay. Books? Any books, books in particular that you have? Yes, titles? I, I, read, I, read, I, read, uh, I read leadership books. I read leadership okay. books. I read... Uh, I read uh, uh, some administrative books and also read uh, uh, religious books, characteristically uh, Christian books, uh, books that not just books, uh, books that are books because uh, the kind of books that I'm reading uh, now are not, not religiosity in aspect, but diversifying how the ministry of Jesus Christ how he went about doing good. So he went about doing good, and which means he actually disarmed these Pharisees or Sadducees, you may call them, these uh, religious leaders that were very constructive in their own way. So when Jesus came, he actually disarmed what they were doing, and they were so pissed off with him because they were doing religion. When he came, he did reality. So he, for example, he went out, and was doing good and they told him it's a sabbath day on a sabbath day you cannot you are not allowed to do anything and he made a statement and said if you have ships 100 ships and one of your ship you left and, and run away on a sabbath day would you not go after the ship and he says why would i stop doing good i'm here to heal those that are were sick and bound for many years i'm here to educate people and to teach them to make them to understand the kingdom and what God planned for their life. And you're telling me that it's a Sabbath day that I shouldn't do this. And so, so I, I learned in these books that I'm reading, I'm also mm. I'm reading Greek. I'm also reading Hebrew as well too, because the original context of Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and then the New mm. Testament was written in Greek. And so the English translation today has there's a lot of uh, dilutions. And so you don't get the original context. And then when you begin to see these things, you understand that it's not a religion. It's a reality of life. It's a way of life. It's love. And it's a love more. And then it's a love that everybody has. Everybody is created. Every child was born with love. When that child begins to grow up, the parents or society or people begins to make their love be constructive. They make their love be very particular. And so, and that's why you see a lot of crime today, a lot of, hate and uh, uh, discrimination today in the world because everybody was born with love and everybody have love and love is like muscles it's like when you go to gym and build your muscles you train every day it's like mm -hmm. the more you use your love the more your love develop but people just have it but they refuse to use them and so that's what jesus brought he brought a different reality which means displeasing sometimes you displease yourself to please others but guess what mm -hmm. people think that people who have love genuine love they are weak. No, God is not weak for showing a genuine love. And that's what we, people like we today, we are destroying the minds of those leaders. And when I speak to a lot of pastors today, they're like, how did you get this revelation? How did you manage to come up with this? I'm like, you are, you are a pastor, you should know. They're like, no. I'm like, because you see, sometimes when you stay in religion, you may, you misrepresent God. God has been misrepresented. A lot of mm -hmm. stuff that happened, everybody says God. But God is love. Yeah. God is love and he has not changed. 
every bad stuff that you see is not from God, 100%. God, has, God, God is love and everything he does is only good. And only good comes. How do we know that? When Jesus came, what did he do? All what he did is representing and the image and the exact movement on how God behaves because God came down in flesh. And so those things help so much and, and has helped also too in life to know what to do, what not to do. And like we're humans and we're developing, but guess what? Love is not weak, but a lot of people don't use them. And as well, when, you know, with the Ten Commandments of the word of God that we received, in society nowadays as well that something that has been a little bit lost is that you treat your neighbor with how you want to be treated you yes. know and that's massive because you know why should you not respect someone because you just don't know that person you know you should treat that person as though they are another it's a human race we are yes. one you know we yes. are together on this planet and we are trying to survive together you know yes. jesse i did a series about that actually I did a speech about that, and, and that, in fact, you know, the, the commandment was not given to us by God, was given, was handled by angels to Moses. Yeah. And the reason the commandment was given by angels to Moses was that the people refused an intimacy with God. So when God mm -hmm. was coming to the people, they said, no, don't speak to us, speak to Moses and Moses. So they put an intermediary. So, mm -hmm. and the commandment is more than, the commandment is, the commandment is, it's just a formula that Moses gave the people because of their heart we had in. But today, it, it, God has placed, what about before the commandment was given? How was people living? They mm -hmm. had a life before the commandment. People in the Bible, like Abraham and Noah, they had a life, which means the conscience was the command. The conscience was it. So today, Jesus came. He came, he knocked the Old Testament because the law was given by angel and then Jesus came and then established a new law and said, the new commandment that I leave for you is that you love your neighbor mm -hmm. as you love yourself. And you, you know what I mean? I just, I just have to say, Prince, because I feel the coherence in your whole story that we had today, uh, the, the love of your father, the, the, love, the love that you had for the game, the loneliness that almost, almost hurt your, your start in Italy, and the love that helped you get through it, mm. the, the, growing from your football, everything connected together. It, it's a, there's a lot of coherence there. You know, I can, yeah. I can see it. It all uh, comes together. It all comes yeah. together. If yes. you had a, if you had a giant billboard, and, and and knowing you, Prince, you probably have a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if you had a giant billboard mm. uh, that you'd display on the Afiran, the highway in, in in Stockholm, for everybody to see, or in any other city, it doesn't have to be Stockholm. Uh, what would you say on this billboard? What would you What would you write to people? Treat treat people the way you want to be treated. I love it. Mm, very good. So we, we've talked about we've talked about a lot of different aspects, Prince. Uh, this is the last the last kind of encum en encapsulating idea here. What makes a difference between levels in a profession? Uh, and maybe it's more of a summary of what you've said. Uh, and what does game insight mean to you? Game insight for me is innovation. And, um, and, and it's, it's the uh, modern uh, way of, of, of displaying football. And, and, and it's, it's, the, it's diversified. It's so used in a broad way where if you, if you look at the way football has been analyzed now, you will see the constructive way and see the way things have been put together. It's like a puzzle that you bring from the old and then combine with the new and then put them together. You get a full package. And it's a whole lot of learning, whole mm -hmm. lot of learning in game insight. And when I see, for example, I, I, I look at it, I'm like, wow. People have people sat down and they've done a very good job, and 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 today today world you can you can basically just sit and and see and see what you can do with your talent and you can use less strength. You can actually use less strength and the way football is constructed today and the way football is being used today individually and collectively is is quite amazing. It's quite amazing. 
Dustin. Really nice answer. Friends, thank you very much for, for taking the time with us today. I think it's really in interesting for our international audience to, to get a sense of your career, of your story, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the message that you bring, mm. uh, which is a very positive message, actually, because, um, because love doesn't cost. <laughs> in a way <laughs> yeah it's really cheap <laughs> and, and 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 value and, and 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 invaluable at the same time uh fantastic prince thank you very much thank uh, you thank you just yeah, good luck on your you, very prince. important good luck on your very important test right now you're taking a covid <laughs> covid test as i understand the test of the times <laughs> yes. i know thank you so much guys it's wonderful speaking to you guys jc yeah. I wish you all the best in your career. And also, I wish you injury safe because also, too, it's very important for football players to have a very uh, uh, optimistic, lucky career to be protected from injury. And I also pray that in those areas, that's where my spirituality comes in. And I tell players, I said, sometimes you don't know what is going to struck you because mm. when you go out, you don't know what is what, what life will bring at you in front of you. But that's where spirituality comes in. And because God knows everything and he also, he can help you. And sometimes he helps is, 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 is like somebody said, why if it's God, why are all the things happening? It's like telling a guy that has an Afro hair and said, uh, and going to a salon and like, why don't you bob this guy's hair? It's like the guy has to come and tell me that he wants to cut his hair. And that's what God has given to humans, free will, free, mm -hmm. free will. He didn't create robots. He created people with choices. And so we make our choices. So he's not forcing anyone. It's just, and so I always tell players that you need spirituality. So to protect yourself, because some, a lot of players have been knocked out with injuries from nowhere. Yeah. And they just, you say life is unfortunate, but something could have also protected them. I've had those experiences when I had injuries and God actually, I got injury. I was supposed to be out for a one year, but I got healed. These things are not, these things are not crazy. They are, they sound crazy, but it was, it happens to me twice. Mm -hmm. I, the last one I had in the national team, I went, I, I got injured and I was supposed to be out against Brazil's, Brazil match with Ronaldinho, all the Brazilian players, 2004. I got injured and I was supposed to be out for four months. That night, Jesus walked into my room, took my feet and put his hand on it. And I woke up the next morning with the game. JJ Okocha saw me and was, he almost ran away. And that made him not to forget me. And he brought his family and discussed some deep things with me and like now i really know because they saw it when mm. i was injured the day before and they saw when i came back playing against brazil and these guys were like how did this happen and i'm like yeah this is my experience in life and this is why i choose this part because it's something very personal and is is spoken to me a lot and has communicated to me and god truly takes care of those who wants him to take care of them Yes, no, but thank you, thank you very much for that as well, Prince. Uh, you know, I really appreciate that a lot. So thank you very much. Bless you. Okay, bless you, bro. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Tony. Love, love you. Yes. Love you. Godspeed. Thank you. Yes.